بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد النبي الامي وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمه وهي لنا من امرنا رشدا ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا انك انت التواب الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد على قدر حبك فيه اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد على قدر نايتك به اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد حق قدر مقداره اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاه تنجينا بها من جميع الاحوال والافات وتقضي لنا بها جميع الحاجات وتطهرنا بها من جميع السيئات وترفعنا بها على الدرجات وتبلغنا بها اقصى الغايات من جميع الخيرات في الحياة وبعد الممات <coughs> اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاة الرضا ورضا عن اصحابه رضا الرضا والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله وشكر الله we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the incredible blessings we're experiencing and for the opportunity to study this blessed material this blessed text of the blessed author rahimahullah ta'ala we ask Allah ta'ala to make us realized in gratitude and that part of gratitude is to realize that we don't deserve the blessings that we have as Imam Al-Junaid rahimahullah ta'ala he said a shukr an la tara nafsaka ahlan al ni'ma that gratitude is that you don't see yourself worthy of the blessing gratitude is that you don't see yourself worthy of the blessing and that Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah he narrates in the Ihya that uh, he relates in the Ihya a narration in which say, uh, Allah Ta'ala revealed to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam the Prophet Jesus peace be upon him that إِذَا أَتْمَمْتُ إِذَا أَنْعَمْتُ عَلَيْكَ بِنِعْمَةٍ فَاسْتَقْبِلْهَا بِالْإِسْتِكَانَ وَتَمْهِمْهُ عَلَيْكَ إِذَا أَنْعَمْتُ عَلَيْكَ بِنِعْمَةٍ فَاسْتَقْبِلْهَا بِالْإِسْتِكَانَ وَتَمْهِمْهَا عَلَيْكَ Or كَمَا قَالْ That um, when, I, when I descend upon you, when I send upon you a blessing, then receive it with the state of humility. Receive it with the state of of brokenness, receive it with the state of uh, a sense of being low and unworthy. Utammimha alayk, that's jawab talab for the Arabists. If you do that, I will complete it for you. I will fulfill that ni'mah. I will take it, I will produce fruits from it of incredible benefit. So the, it'll, it'll give birth to, to much benefit when we, when we have that attitude. And that, so we ask Allah Ta'ala to make us realize in this and specifically for sacred knowledge, the opportunity to study together uh, sacred knowledge and spe- specifically knowledge of the divine uh, ilmul aqidah that, uh, that really it's something tremendous blessing and particularly in a time of so much confusion and in a time of, of so much uh, ideology replacing theology and in a time of... Uh, many forces that are fully engaged in an intellectual battle against religion and uh, you know one of the results of this is that uh, a lot of believers uh, Muslims are you know there are people that are uh, losing their faith there are people on the verge of lo- losing their faith and we we're just having a conversation it's, uh, you know that um, that uh, you know, even some people we know, some of our friends, that they're going through these issues and they're grappling with these issues, and so it's really important that we appreciate the the ni'mah of being able to study this and under, inshallah, gain a deeper understanding of our beliefs and why we believe what we believe in. And we ask Allah Taala to preserve our faith. That Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub, thabbit qulubana ala dinik. That O oh Allah turner of the hearts, make firm our hearts upon your religion. And that this is a dua of tremendous importance that our Prophet ﷺ taught us because as the hadith mentions that the heart of the believer is between usba'in min asabi ar-Rahman quote unquote two fingers of the fingers of the all-merciful yuqallibuhuma yuqallibuha kayfa yasha that he turns, uh, he turns the hearts in whichever direction he wants subhanahu wa ta'ala i.e. between even faith and disbelief. And so that there's no, you know, there's nothing intrinsic about us such that we deserve faith. There's nothing 
special about us such that we are worthy of the religion that Allah Ta'ala has honored us with the, the Tawheed to actually believe in Allah and His oneness. And uh, and so we ask Allah, Ya Muqallib al-Qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik, and that Allah Ta'ala make firm our hearts on on His religion. And uh, uh, and because it's a class on Aqeedah, it's worth mentioning that Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, when he interprets that hadith, that he says that obviously, right, two fingers are not becoming for the divine because Allah Ta'ala is transcendent, as we said, the negating attribute of differing from creation, mukhalifa lil hawadith, would entail that Allah Ta'ala does not have literal uh, physical fingers, but that Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he says that the two fingers here refer to the angelic force and the demonic force, is that the inspiration of the angels to do good, to turn towards faith and to turn towards those things which will deepen and strengthen our faith of good works, of righteous works, of spiritual works. This is the quote-unquote finger that turns towards faith and that the demonic force of Iblis, Satan, and his minions, uh, that those are the, that's the quote-unquote finger that turns towards disbelief because ultimately, هذا خلق الله, both the angelic realm and the demonic realm are from the creation of Allah and that they are, Allah Ta'ala is still fully in control of everything, but He has given, He has given, like humans, He has given the jinn decision, quote unquote, free will, the will to choose. And so they do have that choice. Then those of the devils that choose to tempt uh, shall be taken to account for that. Bismillah. So, Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah that. Um, really reflecting on the blessing of faith and not taking it for granted because uh, there are forces in the seen realm and the unseen realm that are affecting our faith. And so we should take every means possible to strengthen our faith. And that in reality, as important as the science is, in reality, the true way of strengthening faith, the, the most powerful way of strengthening faith, of deepening its roots, and this is a valid analogy because the Quran itself says that the kalima is like a shajaran, shajaratun tayyiba, that it is like a goodly tree. La ilaha illallah is like a goodly tree. And so how do we deepen those roots such that it produces more fruit, inshallah, is through spiritual works, is through taking uh, the religion seriously in terms of avoiding what's prohibited and performing what is necessary and recommended. And... Uh, and that, you know, there are many, many of our masters outlined the means of doing that, of doing that, of how to, how to uh, deepen the roots of faith. That one of them, I believe his name is Abu Khair al aqda rahimahullah, that he said, "Ma balaga ahadun ila halatin sharifatin illa bi arbaatin." That no one ever reached a noble state with their Lord except by four things. He said the first uh, mulazimatul muwafaqa is to consistently adhere to what's called muwafaqa, which is harmonizing or aligning. And the idea is that this term is used for aligning ourselves with the sacred law, being in a state of harmony with the sacred law, with that where, wherever Allah Ta'ala, what He commands to do, that's where we are. And what He forbids us to do, that's where we're not. And trying to develop this, what our masters call a Qur'anic consciousness, that we don't simply read the Qur'an for the sake of, as litany, although that is tremendously blessed, to read the Qur'an for this, as just an ibadah, but the real, we're, we, we seek to develop the, a Qur'anic consciousness, that we, we try to perceive reality as it is with the lens of the Qur'an. And what that entails is that anytime there's a deed of virtue, anytime there's a virtue or a good deed or a righteous work, that we see paradise in that because it's a door to paradise. And that anytime we see something that's unlawful or prohibited or discouraged in the sacred law, that we see the fire behind it and in front of it and all around it. And that this is the, this is the, the, the nadar, you know, the viewpoint, the vantage point of the people of Allah Ta'ala that we seek to emulate, inshallah, is that they don't see the outward temptation of what's wrong, but they see the inward reality of its ultimate destiny, 
which is that it's a door to the fire and it's a door to the displeasure of Allah Ta'ala and that every good deed, every virtue is a door to heaven. And so they literally fold over, this is what the term, one of the terms they use is folding over this world such that they are as if, as it were, in the Akhirah. That their perception is such that the, their, the lens is, it's like a lens, you know, a contact lens you put in, the lens of Akhirah. And so such that they, that's, their, that's, their, that's their vantage point, that's their viewpoint. And, and so the temptation is like gross, Ow, a'udhu billah, that anything haram is just, it's the way most Muslims see pork. You know, pork is not tempting to any Muslim. You offer someone a plate of pork or pepperoni pizza and they're like, gross, get it away. You know, they want nothing to do. It's not something like, oh, I can't wait to get, if only I could have that pork. No. But the, the way of the awliya is that anything haram is like pork. It's just gross. Yeah, anything haram is just, anything that Allah is not pleased with is like pork for the average Muslim. It's just, I don't want nothing to do with it. And so this is muwafaqa. So he said that the way, the first way that no one reached a noble state except the first thing is consistently having muwafaqa, mulazimatul muwafaqa. And then he said the second, wa mu'anaqatul adab. Mu'anaqa is to embrace, right? The onuq is the neck. So you hold to your neck. He said, mu'anaqatul adab is to bring adab and hold it to your neck. Just embrace it. Embrace adab, comportment, good etiquette, good, good, the way we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the Messenger, وسلم, with the inheritors of the Messenger, وسلم, and the scholars of the outward, the saintly people of the inward. And then with our fellow believers, who we should all see as awliya, we should see all of our fellow believers as awliya. And then the khalq, yani bishakl al-am, the entire creation and cosmos, the adab. And a big part of that that we should remind ourselves is, is adab with tribulation. Is that some of them said that patience is to stand with tribulation with adab. Patience is to stand with tribulation with adab. And so that we... You know, it's something that takes tremendous mujahada, but to really force ourselves to have good uh, etiquette, even with the difficulties Allah sends us, because they're from Allah Ta'ala and there's a wisdom in them. And we ask Allah Ta'ala for afiyah. And the third thing he said, wa ada'ul fara'id, is to fulfill all the obligations. Because letting go of that will, will, will make our, it's a, it's a window to our, you know, our faith, na'udhu billah, being uprooted. These are ways of, like we said, deepening the roots. And then the fourth one he said, was suhbatu salihin, is company of the righteous. Company of the righteous that really, and alhamdulillah, just, you know, gatherings like this, I'm in the company of righteous people. It's very beneficial for me, alhamdulillah. And I, it's an honor to be in your company. And so that when we are in the company of the righteous, it, it uh, strengthens the faith in a tremendous way, in a way that's, you know, and that's the key that, you know, why is every companion of the Prophet وسلم, called a Sahabi? Because of Suhbah. That's the one thing they all share. The one thing they all share, belief in the Prophet وسلم, with Suhbah, that they were in his presence وسلم, and the effect that they had on them. And so Suhbah to Salihin, right? Birds of a, of a feather flock together. Alhamdulillah. So uh, we should take the means to strengthen our faith. So returning to the poem then, uh, line 27 that وَقُدْرَةٌ إِرَادَةٌ وَغَايَرَتْ أَمْرًا وَعِلْمًا وَالْرِضَى كَمَا ثَبَتْ So we have been talking about these the seven sifatul ma'ani the affirmative attributes attributes of meaning of Allah Ta'ala and so we were discussing the ta'alluqat which we will complete today inshallah but just to uh, go back to the poem that he says he, when he lists the first two Imam Laqani when he lists the first two قُدْرَةٌ إِرَادَةٌ power and uh, will, he says, وَغَايَرَتْ أَمْرًا وَعِلْمًا وَالْرِضَى كَمَا ثَبَتْ That these two attributes of power and will, what we discussed extensively last time, alhamdulillah, that they differ from the divine command. Okay? They differ from his amr, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah ta'ala, his, the commands and prohibitions of the sacred law are not the same as what Allah wills and creates. They're not the same as what Allah wills and creates. And this is obvious because anything that exists in the world is from the divine decree. It's what Allah chose and what He created and creates at every moment. But obviously not all of it is what Allah commands and what Allah prohibits. That 
much, much of what's in the world contradicts it's con it is contravention of what he commands and prohibits and so uh, that it differs this is important okay uh, in our aqidah and that wa ilman and that they all also differ from his knowledge and we discussed this that his pre-eternal knowledge subhanahu wa ta'ala pertains to all of the uh, it's associated with all of the uh, wajibat, mumkinat, and uh, mustahilat, all of the uh, lo logical necessities, logical impossibilities, and logical possibilities. And so what he knows is different from what he chooses and creates. Warrida, and that the, his will and power differ from his good pleasure. His will and power differ from his good pleasure because, of course, his good pleasure is, is only what uh, he commands to and what he encourages to. That's what, that's that muwafaqa that we discussed, that we try to align ourselves with his good pleasure by fulfilling the commands and avoiding the uh, prohibitions. So, kama thabat, as has been, uh, as has been uh, affirmed in the sacred law, in the sharia, in the Quran and sunnah. And uh, this is, you know, so Allah Ta'ala, he commands to iman. At a basic level, he commands to iman, and he pro he prohibits kufr. He prohibits uh, rejecting faith. Um, but of course, he wills for certain people to believe, and he wills for certain people to disbelieve. And so, for someone like Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Allah be pleased with him, the best of, of this ummah uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah ordered Sayyidina Abu Bakr radhiallahu anhu to believe. And Allah created his belief. And Allah and Allah willed and created his belief. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr responded with his choice to believe in, in the best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But with someone like Abu Jahl, who in Jahiliya was called Abu al-Hakam, right, the father of wisdom, but they, it was changed to Abu Jahl because clearly he did not have wisdom, that uh, he chose not to believe. And he rejected the best of creation, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he, reject, he rejected the message of tawhid. And so his iman was not willed or created because he chose not to believe. But it was commanded. It was commanded still. And so with respect to when Allah commands but does not will, then they say, we resign it to Allah. We consign it to Allah that... It's for a hikmah that only Allah knows. It's for a hikmah that only Allah knows. And the mind, the intellect cannot penetrate into the, into the reasons behind that. Why would Allah create something, will something that he does not command to? That obviously it does not align with his good pleasure. So why would he create it? There's, these are, this is beyond the realm of the intellect. And this, this has to do with the problem of evil is that all of this you know, evil in the world uh, with respect to moral evil, because there's natural evil and moral evil. Natural evil evil has to do with natural disasters, earthquakes, etc. But moral evil, when people, uh, you know, choose to oppress others, tyranny, harming others, uh, and according to the Sharia, any disobedience of Allah Taala, that why would Allah Taala command its opposite? He would command to moral go good, but create the moral evil, right? that this is uh, something that there's hikmah in it, there's wisdom in it, and we cannot penetrate to that rationally. We can attempt to reflect and contemplate, and we can arrive at certain wisdoms in suffering, but ultimately, as Allah Ta'ala himself says, that he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not asked about what he does, but they shall be asked. But they shall be asked. And, you know, reflecting on that, that, Allah Ta'ala, uh, he, he creates what people earn. And inshallah, we're going to cover the cusp versus khalq, that everyone has their cusp. So every tyrant, every oppress, oppressor, every unjust uh, person, they are responsible for their choices. They are responsible for their cusp, what's called cusp or acquisition. And we'll discuss it in detail, inshallah. But, uh, you know, our decisions are petitions to the divine that when we make decisions it's petitioning Allah to create that 
And so then if Allah Ta'ala also wills it, He creates it. So everyone is responsible for what, for what they choose. Everyone is responsible for what they choose and no one is getting away with anything. This is something that, again, that Quranic consciousness, when we keep the Akhirah, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu he used to say in Sahih al-Bukhari, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-Akhirah. Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-Akhirah. Oh Allah, there is no life other than the life of the hereafter. There is no life other than the life of the hereafter. This is what he used to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said it particularly at the time of the Khandaq, when digging the trench when there was a, you know, the 10,000 strong of, of the Arabian Peninsula had gathered, all of these tribes had gathered to just wipe out Islam in Medina. And they had just a few days. And the brilliance of Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi, Allah be pleased with him, that he said, let's dig a trench and that'll allow us to defend the city. And so they were digging that trench and with all the difficulty and the hunger and the difficult weather and the, the impending doom. And the Prophet Sallallahu is, they're doing poetry and he's saying, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha la akhira. Oh Allah, there is no life other than the next life. This is not life, right? This is not life. This is work. This is difficulty. This is tribulation. This is maqam al-sabr. This is, this is, you know, having, having patience and gratitude to Allah. But the next life is life. It's called in Arabic, in the Quran calls the next life al-hayawan. You know, the true life, al-hayawan, which, you know, means the animate, literally. It's as if this world is an animate. It's like a dead realm. And the next life is when it really, and so the, that's the Quranic consciousness. So putting that context with all of the oppression difficulty, no, no oppressor is getting away with anything. You know, if the, if, the, if the ram that got hit by the other ram gets to hit him back in the akhirah, even amongst animals, complete equality, equalization or equality is, is carried out, then a fortiori, human beings, any, any harm that's done in this life from one person to the other will be, you know, that's uncalled for, will be, will be retributed. So... You know, and that the hadith mentions that the person with the most difficult life, with the most difficult life, is simply dipped into paradise, one dip. The person that had the most difficult life is simply dipped into paradise, one dip. And then they're, and they're asked, have you, had, have you experienced any difficulty, any pain before? And they say, no, I've never had pain. With one dip. And so that eternal hayawan, that eternal life, of Jannah is the context. That's the an that's the at the heart of the answer of the problem of evil or theodicy. And this doesn't mean that we're pacifist and quietist. This does not mean that we sit around and say, "Well, every person that's hurt, they'll get to be in Jannah, so we don't have to do anything." No, it's, we're responsible to help, and Allah will ask us. And because Allah will ask us, we have to rise to that challenge of alleviating the suffering of others. But the whole time those people that are undergoing difficulty have that consolation and is that, that what, what awaits them, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and it has even occurred to the human mind. And then, alhamdulillah. So line 28, And his knowledge, and it's not called muktasab, so his knowledge is not derived or acquired. Okay, muktasab, it's not acquired. That his knowledge, as we said last time, is pre-eternal and complete uh, in pre-eternity into eternity. So follow the way of truth and cast out all doubts. Right? Rid yourself of all doubts. Hayatuhu and his life. And his life. And so this is where we left off, that in terms of we were going through the descriptions or the rusum of these attributes, that they say that Again, all of the sifatul ma'ani, the, the quote-unquote genus, uh, is that they're, you know, each one is a sifa azaliya, qa'imatun bidati lai ta'ala, za'itatun alayha, that each attribute is a pre-eternal attribute uh, ascribed to the divine entity and in additional to it, because it's a meaning that we're ascribing or predicating. Uh, for hayat, they say that taqtadi sihat al ilm wa sifat that it logically it entails the validity of being ascribed with the other attributes. 
logically it entails the validity of being ascribed with other attributes because if Allah Ta'ala, you know, if we ascribe to him power and will, then certainly that presupposes that he has life. And so this is what they say in for the rasm, the description of the attribute of life is that it is it's what it entails the validity of being his being ascribed with the other uh, attributes. And in terms of the ta'alluq, the associations, there's no association for li the attribute of life. There's no association for the attribute of life. So the you know that we talked about associations, the ta'alluqat, that the hayat, sifatul hayat, there, there is no uh, association. So it's just an, it's just a you know quote unquote intrinsic act attribute, if you will. And so then that's line 29, Hayatuhu. So that's the fourth. And these four, these four of the Sifatul Ma'ani, okay, Qudra, Irada, Ilm, and Hayat, uh, power, will, knowledge, and life. These are the four that the theologians of our tradition felt and necessary and imperative to present logical proofs for. And the, so the primary proofs for those four attributes are logical. And they're the, they're mentioning they're being mentioned in the texts of the Quran and Sunnah is in this science uh, secondary that primarily they wanted to present the barahin the demonstrative proofs of these four uh, from the perspective of you know demonstrative proofs logical proofs while uh, the t the the they're being mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah is 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 uh, is it. It's uh, in addition. And the reason is the idea of the miracle. It goes back to the Mu'jiza. So what they say is that, uh, you know, a prophet comes, uh, peace be upon them all, and so, okay, why do we believe in, in any prophet? Or why do, would the people around the prophet believe in that prophet? Why? The miracle. So... The miracle presupposes who? God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What attributes of God does it presuppose? So his life, he has to live to give a miracle. His power, will, because choosing that miracle, knowledge. So these four are assumed by the miracle. So if we say that we, we affirm all the attributes based off of revelation alone, then you have circular reasoning. Because revelation is known from whom? The prophet who comes with the miracle. Well, the miracle presupposes those four attributes. So then you get stuck in circular reasoning. So you have to show from other than the prophet that God exists and he has these four attributes. Does that make sense? Whereas with kalam, sama, and basar, although they are necessary attributes of Allah Ta'ala, uh, they're not necessarily presupposed by the miracle. So the for those three attributes, there's a discussion amongst the, the theologians that is the primary proof logical or is it textual? Some said it's still logical, some said it's textual, but the reason they can even have that debate is because it's not, you know, it's, the, the, it's not presupposed by the miracle of, of any prophet. Um, for, those, for the three attributes of kalam, sama, and basar, the logical proof is that if Allah Ta'ala did not have those attributes, then there would be a type of naqs, a deficiency, that would be ascribed to the divine Ta'ala Allah. Because the lack of speech is muteness, and the lack of sight is blindness, and the lack of hearing is deafness. And so, you know, like the Qur'an condemns the people who reject faith as deaf, dumb, and blind. So these are major deficiencies uh, in, in creation. And so they've said that Allah is tra transcendent above all deficiencies. So therefore, lo that's logical proof that he has to have speech, hearing, and sight. Textual proof, of course, that Allah Ta'ala 
he says وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا that he spoke to Musa alayhi salatu salam certain, certainly without a doubt and that وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ that he is all hearing and all seeing so that's from the Qur'an but um, so, so that's in terms of, in terms of the proofs Okay, we'll do Sama and Basar first and then we'll go back to Kalam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So that for uh, Sama and Basar, hearing and sight, that these are again pre eternal attributes ascribed to his entity, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ascribe to the divine entity, that uh, uh, and meanings they're additional to the entity, but in terms of their association, so their attributes of what's called, each one is an attribute of what's called inkishaf, which is disclosure. That's the term that they use. It's a sifa of inkishaf. Sama is a sifa of inkishaf, an attribute of disclosure. Basur is an attribute of inkishaf, disclosure. And that the ta'alluq is to the mawjudat. Okay, so the association of sama and basar is to the mojudat existent things, everything that exists, anything that exists. And uh, so the the basic uh, reasoning is that if you look at, for example, you know logically, if you see, what do we see? We see all sorts of things in creation. We see colors, shapes, sizes, dimensions, directions, uh, you know, qualities, locations. We see all of these things in creation, all these accidents. Well, what's the common denominator? What's the one thing they all share? Because their reality, color is very different from shape in its reality. But all of these accidents, what's the one thing that they share? They exist. And so they say that, therefore, sight pertains to what exists, right? Sight and, and hearing as well. And so Allah Ta'ala, that his, his hearing and sight is associated with all things existent, okay? With all things uh, existent. And uh, so, going back to what we discussed last time of the saluhi and the tanjizi, the saluhi being like potential, tanjizi, actual, or affected, that uh, for sama and basar, hearing and sight, that the ta the ta'alluqat, the associations, there's an association that's tanjizi qadim, okay, that's actual in pre-eternity, which is that his hearing and sight is associated well with what what exists in pre-eternity. What exists in pre-eternity? Allah and his attributes. Allah and his attributes. So that his hearing and sight in pre-eternity was actually associated with himself and his attributes so that Allah Ta'ala sees himself and hears himself subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes as for creation there is a ta'alluq there is this ta'alluq saluhi qadim it's in pre-eternity potential okay with respect to us before we exist potential because we don't exist in pre-eternity so in pre-eternity the association of sama and basar with what will exist in creation is saluhi qadim. It's pre-eternal but potential. Once we exist, it's tanjizi hadith. It's actualized, but it's in time because we're in time. So those are the ta'alluqat of sama and basr. Does that make sense? I'll repeat it, yeah. Okay, the associations of sama and basr. Well, we said in general, his hearing and sight, subhanahu wa ta'ala, are associated with anything that exists, everything that exists, okay, all that exists. So in pre-eternity, the only thing that exists is Allah and his attributes. So his sama and basar are associated 
with himself and his attributes actually. So it's an association that's pre-eternal and actual. Tanjizi Qadim. As for us, we we come into the world, we come into existence. So there's a there's pre-eternity before we exist, and then in time after we exist. So before we exist, his sama and basar subhanahu wa ta'ala is associated with us before we exist as a potential association. So in pre-eternity, it's a saluhi qadim. The association is potential, pre-eternal, with all of creation before it exists. And then the association with all creation after creation exists is in time, hadith, but an actual tanjizi, because Allah does hear and see us at every moment. Okay, inshallah. And then now kalam. Let's discuss kalam. Kalam. MashaAllah. It's the hardest. And the whole enterprise is called kalam because of so much debate about this attribute. Bismillah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Okay, so speech. Let's first uh, let's first mention discuss the the basic rasm, and then we'll talk a little bit about the mistakes of the various groups and why those are mistakes. So the rasm of his sifatul kalam, the attribute of speech, is that again the same quote unquote genus. It's sifa azaliya. It's a pre-eternal attribute. Qa'imatun bidatillahi taala ascribed to the divine entity, most high. Uh, in a meaning that's additional to it, that is laysat laysa bi harf wala saut. That is neither of letter nor sound. Okay, his pre-eternal speech is neither of letter or sound. Munazahatun anit taqaddum taakhur. It is transcendent above uh, order. It's transcendent above order. Something coming first. Something coming second. Munazahatun an al i'rab wal bina, transcendent above grammatical analysis. Munazahatun an sukut and nafsi, transcendent above internal silence, like with humans if we choose not to speak, although we're able to speak. Munazahatun an al afit al bataniya, and transcendent above an impediment, a speech impediment. Like in creation, some people can't even speak, other people can speak but choose not to. So it's, they say that Allah's pre-eternal speech is transcendent above all of that. What does that mean? In the reality, we don't know. But from our perspective, what we can say is that because Allah Ta'ala, uh, because Allah Ta'ala has speech, so there's ijma of all the Muslims and it's mutawatir from every prophet that Allah speaks. Okay, there's ijma of all of the Muslims and it's mutawatir from all of the prophets on Imam Jamian that Allah speaks. So he's mutakallim. Okay. So we get into a, a problem is that well, you know, speech, for example, when we speak, okay, I'm speaking right now and I'm using letters and sounds. So everything that I'm saying is in time. And when I say, for example, for example, there's an F, f, and then that comes first. And then after that, four, O, four, four, R, that comes, O comes next, and R. Then there's a space, four. And then I start again, example, E before X. Before, so you have things coming first. And then you can look at it, you can parse it grammatically. You know, if I say in Arabic, you know, darab zaydun amran, which is the classical. We should change that. Qara'a uh, zaydun al kitaba, that Zayd read the book, that qara'a fi'il madi mabni al fat. So it's mabni. Zaydun fa'il marfu' wa alamatu rafihi al dhammatu dhahira. Al kitaba maful bihi. Mansub, Alamatunas Bihi, Al Fatah Bahira, Ila Akhri. 
that that's, I can do grammatical analysis, their letters, their sounds, their end time, you have order, you have declension, you can look at it, parse it grammatically. I can choose not to speak. I'm silent. And that's a virtue. That's a huge virtue in Islam. Sayyidina Isa, alayhi salatu salam, he was once asked, uh, uh, he was once asked for advice. He, he said, by his disciples, he said, La uh, tatakallamu. He said, never speak. They said, La nastati'ah hadha. Well, we can't do that because we have to <laughs> do things in the world and it requires communication. He said, then he gave rukhsa, he gave a dispensation. Okay, la tatakallamu illa bi khair. Fine, only speak good. Like the default with Sayyidina Isa Islam was to not speak ever, just complete silence. Because the Prophet said, Man samata naja, whoever is silent is safe. But then as a rukhsa, okay, if you have to, darura, in, in, darura, in, in situations of dire need, then only speak the good. But, you know, may Allah Ta'ala give us that virtue. So, so I could be silent. Or there could be a person, la qadr Allah, that has a speech impediment, impediment and they're unable to speak. So all of these things are temporal. All these aspects of human speech are in time. Okay, so we have a problem because it's mutawatir that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mutakallim. He is a speaker. But when we think of speech in the world, we think, we think of things that are created. The aspects of being created in time. Now how do we reconcile this? Because of this, uh, bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, you had different responses. And so the, the Mu'tazila, they said that, well, the way we can understand it is that, yes, Allah speaks, but he, his, the meaning of him, he, he being a speaker is that he creates speech. Okay, the, what, it, what does it mean that Allah is a speaker? Is that he creates speech. So he creates speech, and that speech is temporal, in time, created. So therefore, the Qur'an is created. Big problem. Uh, the other extreme were the Hashwiya and some of the, an the anthropomorphists and some who ascribe themselves to the Hanbali school, so the, some of the extreme that called themselves Hanabila. Uh, and, you know, what Sidi Abdul Kimrad, Allah preserve might call hard Hanbalism, that they said... Uh, well, the letters and sounds of the Qur'an are pre-eternal. That's how we can reconcile it, is that the very letters and sounds that we recite and that are written in the Mus'haf are pre-eternal. And some went so far that they even said the cover of the Mus'haf is pre-eternal, which is obviously absurd, right? That the cover is in time and the letters are in time and the words and the sounds are in time. We, that's why we can access them. And it's a mercy that Allah Ta'ala gave us something that we, you know, spe the speech that we can access, that we can recite and read, because we are in time and we cannot directly access what's pre-eternal. So those are the two sort of extremes. And Ahl Sunnah, yani, tawasatu, they were in the middle. And how did they reconcile it? The way they reconciled it is they said, speech does not have to be letters and sounds. Speech does not have to be letters and sounds. Okay? That to limit speech, if you limit speech to letters and sounds, yes, you have the problem. And then you're, you're lim either what the Mu'tazidi say or the, the anthropomorphists say, one of the two has to, has to be correct. But both are very problematic. So they, the way they got out of it is that speech doesn't have to be with letters and sounds. And they said, for example, that uh, what they called kalam nafsi is that we have internal speech. And so when a person, you know, I said to myself the other day, right, that's without letters or sounds. It's an internal phenomenon, right? A, a, another clear example of this is ishara, so sign language. Okay, so sign language, you call it sign what? Language. It is a language. And all of the meanings or most of the meanings that we have in, in all of the languages that we speak are there in sign language. So... 
but there's no letters and there's no sounds, right? It's hand gestures, it's movements. So if you think about it, the reality of speech is not letters and sounds. The reality of speech is indication or signification. In Arabic, what's called dalala. That's the reality of speech, right? It's just that the form that we use as humans is letters and sounds. But what do we, what do we really do with our letters and sounds is we indicate meaning. We signify meaning. Nadullu, you know, we, we indicate what's called dalala. And the same thing with sign language, it, it's indicating, it's pointing to, which is why they say, look at, you know, verbal speech, which is letters and sounds emanating, you know, through the movement of the tongue and mouth. And then there are these sound waves that, if you look at the reality of that, and if you look at the reality of writing on a paper, which are letters, that, but they're, they're, their marks on paper, there's nothing, there's, they're completely different. Their realities are completely different. The sounds that emanate from the mouth and the marks that are made in, on the page, there, there's nothing in common. There's only one thing in common, which is what? Indication of meaning, signification. So what's the reality of speech is that what, what the only thing that that shares is signification, dalala. And that's why both can be called language or speech, which is why sign language is also a language, which is why our internal speech is also speech. No. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, the person, the look on their face, the way they were, it said a million words. You know, so that's part of sign language, is that human movement of the physical limbs indicating meaning. You know, when a baby cries, it indicates a lot of meaning. And the, the mother is the one that can figure out which meaning is by which type of cry, you know. The, it, like, I get worried every time. Because I'm like, why are they crying? <laughs> but, alhamdulillah, the mothers, they're like, that's, it's fine. They can tell if something's really wrong. Alhamdulillah. So, so just so then, uh, speech is not bound by letters and sounds, and that's why we say that the kalam of Allah, this attribute of God, is pre-eternal. It is His pre-eternal attribute of speech. Okay, so it's not letters or sounds. Let's review what we said. That we said that for its rasm, its description, it's 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 a pre-eternal attribute ascribed to His entity, Subhanahu wa Taala. It's not letters, it's, trans, it's not letter, it's not sound, it's transcendent above. So it's, you know, exalted above any temporality or change, meaning letters, uh, excuse me, the order uh, coming first, coming second, of uh, grammatical parsing, arab of silence, because silence is change. It's going from speaking to not speaking, or impediment, you know, ta'ala that he's exalted above that. So it is just, and that's that's. It's like via negativa. We, we can't know its reality except by negating what is unbecoming for it. Because anything to do with temporality, it cannot be. And that its association, its ta'alluq is one of dalala. Because that's what all speech has to have. And so the ta'alluq of the pre-eternal kalam is dalala. It indicates. What does Allah Ta'ala indicate? What does He indicate? He indicates everything that He knows. And it's always from pre-eternity into eternity, he is constantly indicating everything that he knows. He indicates all the wajibat, himself, his attributes. He indicates all the mumkinat, anything possible, whether it exists or does not exist. And he indicates all the mustahilat, everything that is inconceivable. He indicates it all. So in essence, what he knows, he speaks. Everything that he knows, he speaks. And his speech is, is, uh, is an attribute of his entity. You have a question? Yeah, good. So right now we're talking about his attribute. We haven't talked about the Qur'an yet. 
So we're talking about the attribute of, of kalam, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about the Quran next, inshallah. So the, the, that's a good question. So the attribute, the pre-eternal attribute is indicating everything that he knows. Okay, so it has the same ta'alluq of the attribute of knowledge, which are the wajibat, the, the ja'izat, the, the mustahilat, everything logically necessary, everything logically possible, everything logically impossible. And uh, so, so what he knows, he speaks, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's, uh, there's a debate about what exactly did Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu salam hear when Allah ta'ala said, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمَ Allah definitely spoke to Musa. Because taklima in grammar is mafud mutlaq, which is there for tawkid. So Allah emphasizes the verb. He emphasizes the act of speaking. So وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمَ Allah certainly spoke to Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam in the Qur'an. So that Imam al-Ashari, the eponym of the school, as well as some of his uh, the, the scholars of his school, including Imam Baqilani, that they said that what Allah Ta'ala, the, the speech that Allah Ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam with, that he actually lifted the veil so Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam could hear the pre-eternal attribute. And that's something we can't understand. But that's what, that was the opinion of Imam al-Ashari, that he actually heard the, the speech and there was no intermediary of sound or letters. Uh, Imam Maturidi, he, he, he disagreed. He said that what, what Sayyidina Musa salam, heard was, uh, was a sound, a created sound that indicated that speech. He heard a created sound. Allah created a sound that indicated that speech. And, and that, and, but because there was no intermediary of book or angel, he's called Kalimullah. Because there was no book or angel in that instance as an intermediary, he's called Kalimullah, the one that Allah spoke to. So these are two opinions amongst Ahl Sunnah uh, of, of that reality. But um, going back to understanding the attribute that, again, it's reality. Like everything that we're discussing with respect to Allah and his attributes, we cannot, in the intellect cannot penetrate the realities of these. Okay, of Allah and His attributes. Just as we said, with you know, no one knows Allah except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So similarly, no one knows Allah's attributes, i.e. the realities of His attributes, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, that this is something only the divine knows the divine in His entity and His attributes. But we are approximating, this is what this, uh, this subject is about, to minimize the damage. Okay, to minimize the damage of are all too human minds. Allah forgive us. So, the Mu'tazila, they said that Allah creates speech. Well, the problem with that is if you say that Allah Ta'ala creates speech and then, that, then therefore Allah is a speaker, that means that if Allah creates whiteness, Allah is white. And if Allah creates movement, He is moves. And that if Allah creates redness, he's red. And that if Allah creates stillness, he's still. Because you don't attribute that the trait of what's created to the creator of it. You say he's the creator of whiteness. He's the creator of blackness. But he's not white or black. So similarly, if he created speech, that would make him a speaker. That doesn't account for what we know, mutawatir, from multiple chain transmission, from ijma', from all of the prophets, salam, that Allah speaks. Allah is a speaker. So the only way, the Ahlul Sunnah said, the only way that makes sense that Allah is a speaker is that he has an attribute of speech. Just like the only way it makes sense for him to be all powerful is that he has the attribute of what? Power. The only way that makes sense that Allah wills is that he has the attribute of will. The only way that it makes sense that Allah is all knowing is that he has the attribute of knowledge, etc. And so Allah must have the attribute of speech. And so then, how do you get out of letters and sounds? As we said, is that reality of speech is not bound by letters and sounds. Rather, it is indication. So, what then about the Qur'an? And what's important to remember is that what we discuss right now about the Qur'an, that we're not allowed to 
discuss it outside of an educational setting. This is something the ulama mentioned, that for the purpose of education, we can sort of open up this box and look into it. But aside from that, we're not allowed to speak about this with just, you know, in general with, with the Muslim brother or just over coffee or something, you know, unless it's an educational setting. But because what we know about the Qur'an and what Ahl sunnah affirmed and what we inherited from the Salaf is Al-Qur'an kalamullahi ghayru makhluq. Al-Qur'an kalamullahi ghayru makhluq. That the Qur'an is uncreated, the uncreated speech of Allah. That the Qur'an is kalamullah, it's the speech of Allah, ghayru makhluq, that's uncreated. Okay, and there's a reason why they phrased it that way. And this is why the Mu'tazila, when they said that the Qur'an is created and they had they instituted the, the mihna, the inquisition, and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, uh, he refused to, to hide the truth and he, he, uh, you know, he affirmed what was inherited from the Salaf uh, because to preserve the religion. Is that, no, the Qur'an is kalamullah ghayru makhluq. It's, the, it's uncreated. So then how do we understand now vis-a-vis -vis what we just mentioned of uh, the transcendence of his divine of the divine attribute of speech they say that well and again this is only in educational settings they say that well you know the Quran it's uh, if you consider it from the perspective of letters letters are what in time and therefore Created. If you consider from the perspective of sounds, if the Qari is reciting Qur'an, sounds are in time and therefore created. If you consider it from the perspective of words in the Mus'haf written, words are in time and therefore created. And so those aspects of the Qur'an are obviously created because that's, that's, those, are the, those are the channels that we access Allah's speech from and we are in time so we need something in time but from the perspective of indication that those the words in the Quran and the speech that it indicates or signifies there's a dalala it indicates and signifies the pre-eternal attribute okay that the words in the Quran and the sounds of the Qari when he recites Qur'an and what's written in the Mus'haf of Qur'an, all of it points, indicates, signifies his pre-eternal attribute of speech. And that pre-eternal attribute of speech is what we said is transcendent above anything in time. And because of this amazing relationship of dalala, of indication or signification, we say Al-Qur'an kalamullah ghayr makhluq that it is connected in that way through indication with the pre-eternal attribute of speech. And so from that perspective, it is uncreated because it reflect, it's reflecting that attribute from the perspective of Dalala. And this is something really amazing and we have to appreciate that. You know, the Imam al-Busiri, rahimahullah, he says in the Burda, Ayatu haqqin min ar-Rahmani muhdathatun Qadimatun sifatul mawsufi bil qidami. You know, that, and this is ayah to haqqin, you know, because every verse is an ayah. Verses of truth, ayah to haqqin, signs of truth. And look, signs. Every verse is called an ayah, pointing, signifying. It's all signification, because they point to Allah and His attributes, and specifically His attribute of kalam. Ayah to haqqin, verses and signs of truth. Min al-Rahman from the All Merciful, because the Quran is the is from Allah and it's His mercy that Allah Taala Surah Al-Rahman Al-Rahman Allam Al-Quran. The first thing that Al-Rahman, the All Merciful, He sent down the Quran. It's incredible mercy. Khalq al-Insan, and after that He mentions He created the human being. Even before mentioning our existence, He mentions that He taught Allam Al-Quran. Khalq al-Insan Allamahu al-Bayan, and He taught humans how to signify. Right, the All Merciful, he taught the Quran, his, his speech, which signifies his pre eternal speech. He created the human being with his ontological speech of kun. It's all, kun, it's all speech. Allamahu al bayan, and then he taught the human how to express himself and signify himself, speech. 
And it's all from the mercy of Allah Ta'ala because the surah is called Ar-Rahman. And so that ayatu haqqin min Ar-Rahmani, then Imam Busiri he says, muhdathatun, in time. Muhdathatun, from hadith, in time. So we can access it, qadimatun, but out of time, pre-eternal. Because of this dalala to the attribute of Allah. This dalala that these, the Qur'an indicates the pre-eternal attribute of speech. And then he says, Sifatul Mausufi bil Qidami, an attribute of the one who's described as pre-eternal, i.e. a pre-eternal attribute. That these verses are in time, muhdathatun qadimatun, but also out of time. How? Because they signify his pre-eternal attribute. And what's the context of the Burda? Where did Imam Busiri write this? In a, in a poem praising who? The best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that appreciating how immense the Qur'an is, that it's signifying the pre-eternal in a very profound way. And that, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبْلٍ لَرَأَيْتُ خَاشِئًا مُتَسَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشِيَةِ اللَّهِ That had we sent down this Qur'an upon a mountain, it would have exploded, rent asunder from the fear of Allah. That anything in creation, had Allah Ta'ala sent down the Qur'an, would have, could not handle it. But Allah Ta'ala says that Jibreel alayhi salam nazzalahu ala qalbik that he sends it, he brings it down upon your heart. He brings it down upon your heart, the heart of the best of creation sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the only locus in creation that can receive, that can that's it can it's it it can handle the weighty qawlan thaqila, this weighty, weighty word, because of what it signifies. You know that this is the, the Prophet Sallallahu and that similarly the Qur'an is the Rahmah that Allah sent down but so is the Prophet Sallallahu that he is وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَىٰ رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ the universal mercy and Al-Alameen includes every atom in the cosmos every string if there's a string the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَىٰ رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ why did Allah say لِلْعَالَمِينَ he could have said لِلْنَاسِ he could have said لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ he could have said لل you know, he said للعالمين, that somehow everything in this cosmos is a recipient of the prophetic mercy, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that he is and that now what's the relationship between him and the Quran? Our mother Aisha, Allah be pleased with said, Kana Khulukuhu al Quran, that he was the Quran. He was reflecting the Quran in the way he was. And so this is mercy penetrating. He is signifying and the Quran is signifying all of these amazing things. And so uh this is, this is the way it, it was reconciled, is that the Qur'an, because of this indication, because it's pointing or signifying the pre-eternal attribute of speech, we, 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 ha, we, we say it's ghair makhluq. We say that it's uncreated. Okay, so the Qur'an, kalam Allah, ghair makhluq. And a couple of things about terms is that there's two terms now that we're using, kalam Allah, the speech of Allah, and al-Qur'an the Qur'an, that both of these terms literally have two meanings, okay? But, and this is called, it's called ishtiraq in Arabic. It's, these are mushtarak terms. So one term with more than one meaning in a literal sense, not one literal, one uh, figurative, but both being literal, is that the kalamullah, uh, the term kalamullah and the term Qur'an, both of these Point, they, they signify, ironically, they signify, these two terms signify two meanings. One meaning that's signified by both is the sifa azaliya, is the pre-eternal attribute of speech. The other meaning that's signified by both is the nazam al-mu'jiz, is the, the wording of the Qur'an that we recite, that incapacitates, that is a miracle. They call it nazam al-mu'jiz. So they say that Al-Qur'an, normally what's understood, the first meaning that's assumed when you hear Qur'an is uh, al mujiz, the words. But because it, sh it also indicates the meaning of the sifa, of the attribute, you can't say Al-Qur'an makhluq. That even though the words are created, we don't say that a Qur'an is created because the Qur'an also refers to the sifa and because those words also signify the sifa. And that kalamullah, it primarily, when we hear divine speech, it refers to the attribute. 
but it also literally means the words. And so you have like equivocation that these are, these are terms that have two meanings. But because they both mean the attribute, the preternal attribute of speech, for each one we say غير مخلوق. كلام الله غير مخلوق. Al-Quran غير مخلوق. Okay, and that's why they combine it. Al-Quran كلام الله غير مخلوق. But we know that if the, you, you mean, if when you use the term Quran, you mean, for example, that someone said, I recited half the Quran. I recited half the Quran, i.e. I recited words in the Mus'haf. We know those words are created. Or if someone said, you cannot touch the Mus'haf, you cannot touch the Quran without wudu, right? It's referring to the physical object that we hold and read from. Again, we know that that's created. But we don't say the Quran is created because the Quran also refers to the attribute. And also because the words that are created signify that attribute. So we're not allowed to say that. And so we say, again, the hasil, the upshot is Al-Quran, kalamullah, ghair makhluq. It is the speech of Allah that is uncreated. But we understand what that means and how we were, we were able to balance between the two mistakes of the extreme rationalists, the Mu'tazira, and the extreme, the anthropomorphists. Uh, Naam, question. Because it's such a dangerous issue that they wanted the door shut. They didn't want to take a chance of someone making, you know, assuming or misunderstanding that statement to say to say to understand that uh, his the divine attribute is created. Just to close that door to make sure everyone knows that Allah's attributes are timeless and outside of time and ascribed to His essence. They close that door. Because this is, they say, uh, it's really dangerous, all of these things. Because if you, if you assign anything, any trait of creation to the divine, then you, we're no different from the Christians. If we make the mistake, then that's something that they, that they said, that they would say, well, what's the difference between your understanding of Quran and our understanding of Christ? Right? The word made flesh, well, the word made book. No, it's different. The Al-Quran kalamullah ghair makhluq. And he has a pre-eternal attribute that's transcended above letters and sounds and all of that. But what we recite, you know, it is, there's aspects of in time that we access, but because it signifies that attribute, we say that it's the divine speech, uncreated word of God, uncreated speech of Allah. Sorry. Oh, sure. Yeah. What were you saying? Uh, one more time. Because it's Allah's speech. Okay. It's Allah's speech. So if you say that it's created, how do you attribute it to God? Well, I mean, you know, how do you ascribe the Qur'an to God? Let me ask you. What was revealed? What is the Qur'an? Yeah, like... Right, so, you know, who said him? Who said those words? Well, so they're Jibril's words? That's not what I believe. Jibril, you know, they're not his, he didn't bring them. So we believe that although we say the, the words are created, they're Allah's words. No one, no one said those words first. Like Allah Ta'ala created those words directly and then revealed it as a speech. But uh, we believe that the Quran is God's word. That what's the, what's the, you know, the value of revelation? That it is divine speech. It's not just a document that fell, you know, fell down from the sky, brought by angels. No, it ha we have to have. It is the speech of God, and that's very significant. Mm -hmm. 
as if you separate it from God, if you say that it's created, okay, how is it connected? How is it? Because because the you know this tablecloth is created. That's fine, but it's still created. No. Uh, it loses a lot. Yeah, it's no longer divine speech, and that's and like as we said in the in the beginning, it's it's mutawatir from every prophet that God speaks. So you've lost your aqidah, you've lost your belief that God speaks. Well, then you're saying Quran is not God's speech then, if it's created. How can something created be God's speech? If it's created, how can it be the speech of the, of the uncreated? Now you're giving the purpose, but how is it God's speech again? So if it's created completely, and it's not signifying, a, a, you know, and the Mu'tazili, they didn't just said that the Qur'an is created, they said Allah doesn't have an attribute of speech. So you're losing, I mean, that's, that's not what we believe. Wallahu a'lam. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, then then you, that that's a door leading to basically uh that you know, it was made up from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that it, you know, there was no revelation. You just keep on going going down that path. But uh you know, we're preserving our belief that God speaks. And that's something that's that's from our aqidah from every prophet taught that and that the Quran and revelation from God is his speech. You know, it's not simply something that Allah just made in the world as he made other things for a function, but rather it is divine speech. And that is tremendous. That is something tremendous, you know. Ar-Rahman Allam al-Quran. The All-Merciful taught the Quran. You know, yeah. So the Lawh al Mahfud is created, okay, the preserved tablet is created, and then Allah Ta'ala the the words of the Quran which we said are created are they were created by Allah and written in the Lawh al Mahfud. Right? But unlike any other speech, no one had a cusp. It's not pre The Lawh al Mahfud, no. It's not preeternal, it's creation. Allah created it. Because how how could something other than Allah be pre eternal? You know. Allah created the tablet, Allah created the pen, Allah told the pen to write everything that shall exist, and, and you know, no. There are other questions. What do you mean, sorry? Um, well, the other position is not a type of dualism. So the question was, uh, is, saying, is saying that the Qur'an is the uncreated speech of God, a preserving radical monotheism, uh, you know, the, it's, not, it's not a type of dualism to say that what the Mu'tazidis were saying, you know. So I don't know if the, that's directly related. How? We're just trying to, so what, what Ahlusun is trying to do is preserve what we know factually about God, that He speaks, and that revelation is His speech. Preserve that and reconcile it 
with the logical absurdity that letters and sounds are pre-eternal. Okay, does that make sense? We're trying to preserve what we know factually from mutawatir that every prophet taught that Allah speaks and that revelation we believe is God's word, it's God's speech. How do we reconcile that with the fact that letters and sounds and writing are in time? And the fact that we can grammatically analyze words and all of these things are aspects of time. This is the only rec reconciliation and it's the best one. You know, is that speech is not limited to letters and sounds and that what we recite signifies, it indicates the, the preternal attribute, you know. And there was, I think, another question, yeah. What we discussed today? Uh, well, we're preserving our beliefs and we're showing how, again, there is a, on the surface, there's a, a logical, a type of contradiction, right? And people of intelligence, they don't like logical contradictions. People of intelligence, if, if it's not going to, if it's going to lead to a logical absurdity, then they're going to clearly reject it. So in a way of presenting our faith for ourselves and for others in a way that we are able to reconcile logical contradictions, I think is, it's, it's something essential and it's, it's a, but it is a communal obligation. Now, you know, the johara, this is not what every Muslim needs to know in terms of just basic creed. This is an, this is an intermediate text. And so for those people that want to study aqidah or kalam at a deeper level, then this is something that one of the issues that have, they have to deal with. And it's important to know our history too, because this did cause a lot of suffering. A lot of people were tortured because of this issue. And that a lot, and, and scholars refused to concede on this point because they felt that this is essential. Right back to the sister's question, you know, why would Ahmed ibn Hanbal go through all that torture and refuse to agree? Because it's preserving factually what we know about God and it's preserving our understanding, our knowledge of the Quran and that this is significant because it's, it's Allah Ta'ala's words and that to, to corrupt what we know factually is, is, you know, especially about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about the Quran, it's, uh, it, it, what is more important? That's what people like Imam Ahmad would say, rahimahullah. Any other? Brother Aaron asks questions to me all the time. So we established that the Quran is the speech of God. Yeah. So how does that Yeah, so again, uh, the, the Qur'an, it's Allah Ta'ala revealed it all at once to, you know, to the Lawh al-Mahfud and then in, in parts with the lifetime of the best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that uh, the, as it came down, it, it uh, was dealing with the context of that time and the events of that time that's very clear from the Qur'an. So abrogation is simply you know, that certain verses abrogate other verses because uh, certain verses were revealed for a limited applicability that, or temporary applicability for a wisdom of that time and place, and then it was to be abrogated. And so in concern of this, the specifics of the situation, some of the situations at that time. But uh, again, that, that's a reflection of, you know, of the you know, from the perspective of the words and the, that context, that's obviously in time and that's why abrogation can happen. But from the perspective of it signifying the divine attribute, right, that they're all still signifying the divine attribute, right? And, and they say, that, you know, we, we didn't go as deep into signification 
we kind of kept it general to make it easier. But uh, there was some discussion as to what's the nature of the signification. You know, is it what's called urfiya? Is it aqliya? Is it iltizamiya? Is it to the madlul of the sifa? Is it to what's indicated by the attribute, or is it the attribute itself? These are a lot. There's a lot of details that we could go into, but we chose not to, just because, you know. But th to sort of present it in a sort of simplified way, that there's, you know, the the exact nature of that of the signification of the words of the Quran to the divine attribute of speech is something that the ulama did discuss. That some said it's from one perspective, some said no, it's another perspective. But the hasil, the upshot, is that there is indication that the the, the words of the Quran signify the pre-eternal attribute of speech. And there is and and you know the exact nature of that we cannot understand. But that's what we believe. And that's why it can be called divine speech that is uncreated, despite the fact that the letters and the sounds are created. But we know because of this connection or indication, it's connected or indicating the divine attribute, which is pre-eternal. And so that's why we can ascribe it to Allah as Kalamullah. Kalamullah. You know, and we should just appreciate, you know, then it also leads to ta'adheem, that we should have immense veneration for the book of Allah, you know, that it's, this is reflecting his attribute. And it's just like, you know, the Prophet said, فَضْلُ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْكَلَامِ كَفَضْلِ اللَّهِ عَلَى خَلْقِهِ And I believe Tirmidhi, that the, the, the merit of divine speech over all, of this, all other speech is like, is like the merit of God above his creation. And that, you know, Alif Lam Mim, the Prophet said, Sallallahu it's not that Alif Lam Mim gives, is one letter that gives 10 hasanat. Alif is one letter that gives 10 hasanat. Lam is one letter. Mim is one letter. So these are, you know, these are, this is as sacred as sacred gets. Um, Yeah, so all revelation has that same signification. But the, the texts of those earlier scriptures of the Torah and Injil, the texts of those were changed. Okay, but in their original form, they had that same signification to the divine attribute. And so that's the difference. Whereas the Quran, Allah promised to preserve the text itself. No. So the you know the the uh, the Quran is that the the words are from Allah Taala, and and then uh, obviously the meanings that with Hadith uh, for Hadith Qudsi that the the revel it's revelation to the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu or inspiration, and then he he expresses in his own words, but it's from behalf on behalf of Allah Taala. Okay, so it's the words of, of the Prophet Sallallahu InshaAllah. Tayyib. So that's the most difficult issue, that and the ta'aluqat. So inshaAllah, it should be smooth, smooth sailing from here. And uh, naam. And so we've done that line 29, Hayatu kadal kalamu samu thum al-basar bidhi atana samu. InshaAllah, we finished the sifat al-ma'ani. And uh, alhamdulillah, we ask Allah Ta'ala to accept our efforts, forgive us for our shortcomings, and protect us from saying or believing anything incorrect. Wa sallallahumma ala Sayyidina Muhammad, an-nabiyyul umi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.